So um, I am uh, going to review uh, some uh, basic uh, results uh, on uh, toposis. So of course, uh, toposis, uh, the notion of topos uh, was introduced uh, by uh, Grotendieck uh, in the late uh, 50s or uh, around uh, 1960. And uh, they were first introduced uh, as uh, generalized categories of sheaves on uh, so-called uh, sites, uh, which means uh, categories endowed with a topology. Uh, but uh, it was uh, discovered uh, a little later that uh, toposis can also uh, be presented in a very different way as uh, classifying uh, objects for uh, first order theories uh, in the sense of logic. So it is a very different uh, point of view on exactly the same objects. So uh, the presentation, the original presentation of toposis uh, by uh, sites is uh, a geometric, can be seen as a geometric way to present toposis. And uh, here, what I'm going to talk about uh, is a linguistic uh, way to present uh, toposis uh, from a mathematical theory, uh, linguistically uh, presented uh, uh, in some way. So uh, my uh, lectures uh, will uh, consist in uh, three parts. So first, uh, I will introduce a sheer notion of classifying topos. Uh, I will immediately uh, state uh, the theorem of existence of classifying toposis. And then I will spend some time explaining the meaning of this theorem. Uh, the second part of the lectures uh, will uh, sketch uh, the proof of this theorem. Uh, and uh, I shall uh, especially uh, present uh, so-called uh, syntactic categories uh, endowed with their uh, um, syntactic topology, uh, which allow to uh, define, to construct classifying toposis as toposis of sheaves on some sites associated to the theories we consider. So uh, these two parts of the lectures uh, uh, date back to the 1950s. Uh, I will immediately uh, say uh, the names of the people who were involved in uh, this theorem and its proof. And uh, the last part of the lecture uh, will also consist in uh, basic results, uh, but uh, which are uh, more recent. Uh, so this is uh, taken uh, from the PhD thesis of uh, Olivia Caramello uh, 12 years ago and her book, uh, Theories, Sites, Toposis. So these uh, basic results uh, allow uh, to uh, make, uh, or to begin to make, uh, the theory of classifying toposis efficient uh, for uh, establishing uh, concrete results in mathematics. OK, so by now I begin with the notion of classifying topos. And I immediately uh, state uh, the following theorem. So this theorem, uh, I think, uh, was uh, proved in full generality in uh, 1975. Uh, and uh, quite many people contribu contributed to this theorem. So here I have written the names of Mackay and Reyes, uh, because uh, in fact this theorem was stated on proof for the first time in a book by Mackay and Reyes. Uh, but uh, this work certainly depended on some uh, very important earlier work by Lowyer, and I think some other uh, mathematicians or uh, categorizations of the same circle uh, played a role in establishing this theorem. Uh, so I, I also wrote the name of Joyal, André Joyal, and uh, I should add that uh, this theorem uh, systematizes systemat is or generalizes uh, some uh, ideas uh, which are already uh, present in particular cases in the PhD thesis of Monique Hakim, uh, who was a student of Grotendieck. So this means that uh, at least part of the stuff, uh, in fact, 
uh, uh, was uh, certainly uh, already present in the mind of Grotten. So uh, here is a statement, uh, but uh, maybe at the present moment, you will not fully understand the statement of the theorem. And the purpose of the first part of these lectures will be to explain, uh, to fully explain the meaning of this theorem. So um, you, here you consider the so-called first order uh, theory, uh, which is uh, geometric. So geometric is some kind of uh, technical condition, which will be explained later. But in fact, it is not restrictive, uh, which means that uh, for any first order theory, in fact, there is a way to make it geometric uh, without changing uh, the set theoretic models of the theory. So this uh, technical condition is not uh, restrictive, uh, is not very restrictive. And uh, this is the uh, first thing we can have in mind about uh, this notion. Then for any such theory, there exists a topos. So uh, I shall explain a little later what is a topos. Uh, a topos endowed with a universal model of the theory such that for any other topos E, uh, there is a natural equivalence of categories between the category of models of the theory in E and the category of morphism, of toposis morphism, from E to the classifying topos ET. So this statement looks familiar uh, for anybody uh, who knows the, no the notion of classifying object of a representable functor. Here, uh, what we are saying is that any theory, any first order geometric theory, defines a functor of so-called models. And this functor is representable by a particular topos. So this uh, theorem is extremely general. It applies to any first order geometric theory, and uh, it allows to associate to any such theory, so which means to any linguistic presentation of a first order theory, it allows to associate to it a topos, which in fact is a geometric object. Toposes were invented by Grothendieck as uh, the most general notion of space, of geometric object, uh, which could exist in mathematics. This is really what Grothendieck thought. OK, uh, so even if you don't fully understand the statement of this theorem at the present moment, it is not important because uh, we shall explain that uh, more, uh, with more details uh, in the coming hour. Okay, so before I begin with the explanation, I want to make a few remarks. So the first remark is that uh, given uh, such a theory T, uh, is classifying topos uh, and of the, with the universal model of T in this topos is uniquely determined up to equivalence. Um, the second remark is that T belongs to the world of logic. So here, uh, logic should not be understood as uh, some very particular part of mathematics. Here, what it really means is uh, formalization of mathematics, linguistic presentation of mathematics. Anytime we do mathematics, uh, we begin by uh, presenting uh, one or several theories. And uh, even if we don't think about it, uh, we are using the language of logic to present any theory we want to study. So uh, this is really how uh, things have to be uh, seen as respect with uh, this theorem. Uh, OK, so on one side of the theorem, you have formalized mathematics, a, a, a linguistic presentation of some theory. And on the other side of the theorem, you have an associated topos, the so-called so uh, classifying topos of T, which belongs to the world of geometry and topology. So for Grothendieck, I repeat, the notion of topos was the most general notion of space. 
Uh, yet uh, another very important remark is uh, the particular case of the, this theorem when we take for E uh, the simplest uh, non-trivial topos, which is a category of sets. And if we just specialize the theorem to this particular case, we get that the, we get an equivalence between the category of points of the classifying topos and the category of set theoretic models of the theory. So this particular case is especially important because in general, when we study a theory in mathematics, uh, we are looking for its set theoretic models. For instance, if we think about the theory of groups, what do we mean by a group? We mean a set endowed with a structure of group. What do we mean by a ring? We mean a, um, a set endowed with a structure of, of ring. So this means we are considering set theoretic models of the theory of groups or set theoretic models of the theory of rings and so on. And here, what this theorem says is that there is a geometric interpretation for that. Uh, the set theoretic models of any such uh, first order geometric theory can be seen as the points of some associated geometric objects, the classifying topos of this theory. Uh, okay, so uh, here, uh, this is, uh, so this means uh, that uh, in some sense, this theory of uh, classifying toposes uh, could also be called a functorial uh, theory of models. Uh, by now, remark five, uh, which is also extremely important, it is the fact that, of course, as we said, for any first order geometric theory, there is an associated classified topos, which is uniquely determined up to equivalence. But in the other direction, given any topos, there are infinitely many theories, T, with the same classifying topos up to equivalence. Um, and uh, this uh, remark uh, gives rise to uh, the theory introduced by Olivia Caramello of toposes as bridges. Because uh, what uh, Olivia has uh, used, has be begun to use in a systematic way, is a relation between theories which is defined by the property to have, the, to have equivalent classifying toposes. So uh, this can be seen uh, as a theory, as a general theory of translations, because as I said, theories uh, have to be understood as linguistic presentation of mathematics. Any theory is a choice of a language and a grammar to present some mathematical content. And the associated classifying topos is a geometric object which incarnates the meaning of that theory. So when there are two theories with the same associated topos, it is exactly as having two languages, possibly very different, which have exactly the same mathematical content, which means which exactly tells the same story. And uh, as we already remarked, for any given content, which means for any given topos, there are infinitely many theories, or if you prefer, infinitely many languages, which allow to present this content. So this is uh, this remark is the beginning of uh, of the possibility to use toposes as bridges between theories, which possibly uh, could be completely different. Okay, so um, by now I want to explain the different ingredients in the theorem. And so the first ingredient, of course, is the word topos. So I want to explain a little, or at least to recall, 
uh, uh, what is the topos. So in order to have an idea of what is the topos, uh, we need to begin with examples. The first example is uh, consists in toposes associated to topological spaces. In fact, this is really like that, that uh, toposes were born. So uh, starting for in, from any topological space, uh, it is possible to associate to it the category of sheaves, and here I mean sheaves of sets, uh, on the topological space X. So I will not recall here what is a sheaf. Uh, in fact, uh, Olivia in her own lectures uh, this afternoon uh, will do it. Um, but uh, immediately, I state the following proposition, uh, will, which tells us that uh, it is almost the same thing to know a topological space or to know the category of shields on this topological space, which means to know the associated topos. Uh, first, there is a general notion of points per topos. Uh, and the first basic fact is the fact that any point of the topological space X we consider with the usual signs induces induce, uh, points of the associated topos. And this map is one to one if X verifies. Uh, uh, an elementary uh, property, the property to, to be sober, which in, in fact is verified in most cases. It is verified by uh, all our uh, topological, concrete topological spaces you know. And in the same way, open subset of X correspond to open subtoposes of the topos EX. So I don't define here the notion of open subtopos or the notion of point of a topos, but what I Stress is the fact that in the world of toposis, there are categorical notions, such as the notion of points and the notion of open subtopos, which allow to recover, to recover not only the underlying set X, but also its topology, so the full topological space. And so uh, this means that the notion of topos generalizes the notion of topological space. And it also means that these notions realizes an embedding of topology into category theory. So this is really amazing because uh, it means that in this way, uh, we go from one world uh, to, uh, to another world from the world of topology to the world of category. The world of topology is a world of continuous structures, whereas the world of categories is a discrete world. So it is very surprising that such an embedding exists. And uh, the sheer fact to go from one world to such a different world is already extremely uh, deep and uh, in itself. And not only it is deep, but by going from topology to category theory through the construction of the associated toposis, in fact, we enlarge a lot the world of topology. Uh, and this also is very important. This becomes immediately clear when uh, we come to the second type of example of toposis, which is given by groups. So, so for any group, we can consider the category of sets endowed with an action of the group. And this also is a topos. In fact, here we have the two basic examples of toposis. On the one hand, uh, topo, uh, categories of sheaves on a topological space. On the other hand, categories of sets endowed with an action of a given group. And, uh, uh, the notion of topos is pertinent, in particular, because these categories of sheaves on a space or of sets endowed with an action of the group 
have very similar categorical properties. Uh, add, as uh, uh, Grotendieck had uh, uh, yeah, yeah uh, as Grotendieck had remarked. Okay, and uh, the example of groups can immediately uh, be uh, generalized uh, in the following way. If we start with any small category, then we can consider the category of precious on this small category C. This is, by definition, the category of contravariant factors from C to the category of sets. So this is a generalization of uh, representations of groups. And this, again, is an example of a topos. So all these categories which I have mentioned, shifts on a space, uh, actions of a group on a set, or um, precious, which means contravariant factors from a small category to sets, all these categories have similar categorical properties and in fact, I will come to that a little later. We, what are the main general properties of toposis? So um, when we come to this, uh, um, to this uh, um, um, to this um, uh, categories of precious, uh, it is uh, very important uh, uh, to state the following proposition, which of course is very well known. Uh, so start from a small category C, uh, then consider the category of precious. And uh, the content of the proposition is that this category of precious, C at, can really be seen as a completion of C. So the first point is that C is embedded in C at. For any object of X, you consider the associated contravariant representable precious, uh, so uh, which consists in all arrows from an arbitrary object to X. And uh, so this functor, which to any object of C associated the functor it represents, so this functor is fully faithful. So we have a fully faithful embedding of C into C at. And on the other hand, any object of C at, so any pre-shift, can be written as a co-limit, or if you prefer, an inductive limit of such representable functors. So here, uh, in order to realize that, the indexing category is the so-called category of elements of the pre-shift you consider. So this means that the objects of this category of elements consist in object X of C uh, endowed with an element of the image of X by the pre shift P you consider. So this is an indexing category. Uh, but the first important fact is that any object in the category C at is an inductive limit of representable object. So this is why I say that C at can be re really be considered as a completion of C. Okay, uh, by now uh, I propose uh, a general definition of toposis, uh, but once again, Olivia will uh, come back to that point uh, this afternoon. So uh, here I define a topos as a category which is both a quotient and a subcategory of some category of precious. So a topos is a category such that for some small category C at, uh, there exists a pair of adjoint functors from C at to C and from E, uh, from, excuse me, from C at to E and from E to C at such that, so first, this pair of functors is adjoint. So this, more precisely, the functor from C at to E is left adjoint to the functor from E to C at. Secondly, 
the right adjoint functor from E to C at is fully faithful. So it is a fully faithful embedding. E can be seen through this functor as a subcategory of C at. And as uh, this pair of, of functors is adjoint, uh, the fact that this functor is an embedding is the equivalent to say that the composite functor of the embedding by uh, um, composed with its left adjoint is isomorphic to the identity functor of E. So E is a subcategory of C hat. It is also a quotient of C hat through this left adjoint functor, which is called the shiftification functor. And the composite of these two functors is naturally isomorphic to the identity functor of E. And the last point in the definition is that we want the left adjoint functor to respect finite limits, finite projective limits. Okay? So um, this, uh, you see, is a very categorical definition. Uh, then we can make a few remarks. Uh, so first, uh, the fact that the, uh, the G uh, lower star component from E to C hat respects arbitrary limits. This is because it is right adjoint to some functor. And uh, the J upper star component from C hat to E, the shiftification functor, respects arbitrary co-limits, arbitrary inductive limits. This is because it is left adjoint to some functor. Uh, as a consequence of this uh, remark yeah, is the fact that if we consider the canonical functor from C to E, which is a composite of the Yoneda embedding into C hat with a shiftification functor, so this composite can be denoted L, then we get that any object of E can be written as a co-limit of images of objects of C by this canonical functor. So this is just a consequence of the fact that this is already true for C hat and uh, the functor uh, G upper star respects co-limit. Okay, uh, by now I want to recall uh, that um, uh, such uh, uh, purpose presented in a very abstract way uh, can be uh, defined in a more concrete way by a so-called Grothendieck topology. So here uh, we can um, define topologies in the following way. Consider an arbitrary object X of C, and let's consider subobject of the representable pre-shift associated to X. So, so what is uh, such a subobject in the category C at? It is just a family of morphism from arbitrary object X prime to X, which is stable under any composition with any morphism from some uh, X prime prime to X prime. It is stable under right composition. So such a family of morphisms stable under right composition and which all go to X uh, is called a sieve of X. And uh, by now, if we have a topos uh, uh, presented from SIAT as in the previous page, a sieve uh, on X, which means a subobject of the representable pre associated to X, is called covering if this embedding from S to Y of X becomes an isomorphism after shiftification. Okay, so the, here we have a notion of covering sieve uh, for any object X. And we can denote GX, the family of all covering sieves of such an object X. And then we can consider not only one X, but all possible objects X of C 
And so we have an index family of covering seeds. And this is called a Grothendieck topology on C. Um, OK. And uh, by now, it is uh, easily checked uh, that uh, such a topology defined in this way uh, verifies some axioms. So in fact, there are three axioms uh, which are very easy to verify. There's a maximality axiom, uh, which says that uh, when we consider an arbitrary object X, then the full sieve of X consisting of all the rows to X is always covering. Uh, secondly, uh, the stability axiom. If we consider any euro from X prime to X in the category C, and any, cover, any sieve S on X which is covering, then it's spelled back through the, the, the morphism we are considering is still a covering sieve of X prime. And uh, lastly, there is a slightly more subtle uh, transitivity axioms, which says that if we are considering a covering sieve S of some object X, and a sieve S prime of X whose spellbacks by all elements of S are coverings, then it is a covering sieve of X. So this is a little more subtle. The important point is that uh, uh, it is uh, not difficult to, to get uh, that any topology defined as in the previous page uh, verifies these three properties. And, then, and now the second part of the theorem is the fact that conversely, any index family of sieves which verifies these three axioms defines a topos endowed with two functors uh, which allow to recover the topology J. So to consider a topos presented from C at through these two functors is the same thing as uh, to consider a Grothendieck topology on X. Okay. Uh, okay, and uh, by now, I want to state uh, the main categorical properties which are verified uh, by toposis. So toposis are particular types of categories. They are categories which can be constructed from categories of species by the type of construction we presented in the previous pages. But it happens that because they are deduced from uh, categories of precious in this way, they inherit from categories of precious some uh, very special properties. So first, uh, any topos is a locally small category. So this means that given two objects in a topos, the morphism between these two objects make up a set. Secondly, in an arbitrary topos, there are, in any topos, there are arbitrary co-limits and arbitrary limits. Thirdly, uh, for any morphism in a topos, the associated pullback functor defined by considering the fiber product over this morphism not only respects arbitrary limits, but it also respects arbitrary co-limits. Uh, another important property is that in a topos, sums are disjoint. So this means that, uh, for instance, if we consider two objects on the topos and we make up their sum, the limit of the diagram consisting in these two objects without any morphism, uh, then, of course, this sum contains as sub-objects the two uh, objects we started with. And the intersection of these two objects inside the sum is equal to the initial object of the category, or if you prefer, to the empty object of the category. 
So this, of course, is familiar to us in the case of FET. Uh, but here, we say that it is also verified in an arbitrary topos. Another extremely important property, uh, which is also familiar to us in the case of sets, but which is verified in any topos, is the fact that to consider a quotient object of some object E, which means to consider an epimorphism from E to some object Q, is the same thing as to consider an equivalence relation on E, which means a subobject of E cross E verifying the usual axioms, axioms of equivalence relations. It contains the diagonal, it is symmetric, and it is transitive. Uh, and the link between uh, these two uh, presentations is the fact that uh, the equivalence relation is just the fiber product of E with itself over the quotient. And the quotient is recovered from the equivalence relation by considering the co-limit of the diagram consist consisting of R, the equivalence relation, E, the uh, ambient object, together with the two morphisms, the two projections from R to E. Uh, okay, another uh, important property is that in a topos, the subobject of any object and the quotient object of any object make up sets. And uh, the last property I want to state is the fact that in a topos, a morphism which is both a monomorphism and an epimorphism is an isomorphism. Of course, this is also familiar to us in the case of sets. If you have a map, which is both injective and onto, then it is bijective. In other words, it is invertible. But this is true, this is still true in an arbitrary topos. And uh, here, there is a very remarkable theorem of Giro. Uh, so Giro was a student of Rotendik. Uh, so the theorem tells us that these properties characterize toposis uh, uh, with the only, for this we need an extra condition, is, which is the fact that uh, the category we are considering is not too big. So here is a precise statement. We consider a category E verifying all properties of the previous page. And then we suppose that in this category E, uh, it is possible to identify a small full subcategory such that for any object of, the, of E, uh, there is an epimorphic family of morphism from objects of C to X. So in some sense, uh, this means that E can be considered as generated by C. And then, uh, the, uh, for such a C, there is an induced technology, uh, J. Uh, you decide that a sieve of an object X of C, which means, which means a subobject of Y of X in C at, is covering if it contains an epimorphic family. So here, epimorphic refers to uh, the categorical structure of E. So this is a, a definition. And uh, then the statement is that uh, the category E is the quotient of C at defined by the topology G. In other words, it is a category of shields on the category C endowed with a Grotendieck topology J. So uh, this means that by now we already have a double characterization of, um, of, um, of toposis. So the first characterization was constructive. Toposis were categories which could be constructed in some way. And here, thanks to this theorem, we have a second characterization. Toposis are categories which verify the properties of the previous page plus 
the existence of such a generated small subcategory. Another uh, remark we can make here, which is very important, is the fact that uh, this theorem means that uh, a given topos uh, can be presented in uh, infinitely many ways from uh, small categories uh, C and all with topology. Because here we can uh, take in this theorem, we can choose for C any small category, any small sub full subcategory of E, which is big enough to generate E. And there are infinitely uh, many choices for that. And this also is part of the, uh, this um, uh, extremely uh, interesting properties of toposes that they can be um, uh, presented in infinitely many ways. So I already mentioned that they can be presented in infinitely many ways from theories, as we shall see uh, later in, with more detail. But here, thanks to this theorem, we also know that a topos can be presently in infinitely many ways from categories endowed with topologies. So this presentation, of course, is more geometric, whereas the other one is linguistic. And so the, uh, here I mentioned again uh, that the full theory of uh, that Olivia uh, Caramelo has proposed to use these basic facts uh, to um, uh, uh, make toposes bridges between theories and also between uh, uh, categories endowed with topologies. So I will uh, come back to that later uh, because, in fact, we shall make use of several such bridges to establish presence. Okay, so by now I uh, can uh, I just uh, recall the basic uh, examples um, um, I had already talked about. So the first basic example is uh, is uh, the example of topological spaces. So we said that for any topological space, uh, there is an induced topos, uh, the topos of sheaves of this topological space, but of course, when we talk about topological spaces, we also have to consider continuous maps. So uh, topological spaces make up a category. And here, a basic uh, fact is that whenever we have a continuous map between two topological spaces, then this map induces a pair of functors between the associated toposes of sheaves on X and Y. So uh, a pair of functors which are right joined to one to the other, so this means that they go in the two reverse directions. So there is a so-called push forward functor from which transforms sheaves on X into sheaves on Y. And there is a so-called pullback functor uh, which goes in the reverse direction. It transforms sheaves on Y into sheaves on X. And it is a fact that these two functors are adjoint. Uh, so the uh, pullback component is left adjoint to the push forward component. So this means the push forward component respects arbitrary limits. The pullback component respects arbitrary co-limits. And as a matter of fact, the pullback component also respects finite limits. Okay, uh, by now, uh, we remark that if uh, we have a topos, which is defined by a topology J on some category C, then the topos C at and the topos C at J are related by a pair of functors. In fact, for us, it was a definition in the way I presented toposes. So they are related by a pair of functors, which verify exactly the same properties as the functors induced by a continuous map between topological spaces. 
So this for, uh, pair of functors are adjoint. Uh, and uh, the component J upper star respects not only co-limits, but also finite limits. Uh, so let's uh, find out whether uh, we know other situations uh, with such pairs of functors. So in fact, there is one, uh, which is quite elementary, but uh, very important. So let's consider an arbitrary functor, rho, uh, between two small categories. So of course, uh, this uh, functor defines an associated functor in the reverse direction between the, the associated categories of pre-shifts, because a pre-shift on D is a contravariant functor from D to set. So if you compose it with rho, you get, of course, a contravariant functor from C to set. So in this way, you define a functor which goes from D hat to C hat. It transforms pre-shifts on D into pre-shifts on C. And here, a very important fact is that this functor, this, uh, uh, this functor of composition with rho, has two adjoints, one left adjoint and one right adjoint. So the right adjoint is denoted rho lower star, and uh, the right adjoint is denoted in this way with uh, such a type of uh, dot. Uh, um, of a sort of substaff of, of mark. And as uh, the functor of composition rho per star has two adjoint, of course, it means that not only it respects arbitrary co-limits, but also arbitrary limits. And so we have an adjoint pair, rho upper star, rho lower star, such that the left adjoint component, rho upper star, respects, in fact, not only finite limits, but arbitrary limits. Okay, so these examples, especially the first one, uh, lead to the following definition. A morphism of toposis, by definition, is a pair of adjoint functors, the so-called pullback functor and the so-called push-forward functor, uh, such that the pullback component, which means the left adjoint component, also respects finite limits. So here, it is just a definition, okay? Uh, and here, um, of course, we remark uh, that as we are talking about functors or pair of functors, they naturally make up a category. Given two toposis, E prime and E, and two morphism of toposis, from E prime to E, so this morphism we call F and G, then by definition, a transform of such morphism of toposis is a transform of functors between the pullback components. So by definition, a morphism from F to G is a morphism of, if you prefer, a natural transformation from F upper star to G upper star. And because they are adjoint, uh, this is the same thing as a morphism from G lower star to F lower star. So here you have to be careful that taking the adjoint, the um, euro uh, has to go in the other direction. So to give a morphism from F upper star to G upper star is the same thing as to give a morphism from G lower star to F lower star. So in particular, the category of points of a topos is by definition, the category of morphism of toposis from set to E. So of course, the category of set is a, is a topos. It is just the category of precious uh, on uh, the, the category uh, consisting in just one object and one morphism. Or if you prefer, uh, it is also the category of sheaves of the space of the topological space with one element. So a point of a topos, by definition, is a morphism of toposis from set to E. And 
points defined in this way make up a category. It is not only a set, it is a category. Uh, in fact, in general, it will not be a set uh, because it can be uh, bigger, but it is a set in uh, quite many cases, um, but not always. Uh, and the last part of the definition is the notion of embedding of toposes, if you prefer the notion of subtopos. So uh, what it is, it is a morphism of toposes consisting in a pair of adjoint functors, J upper star, J lower star, such that the push forward component, J upper star, is fully faithful. And this is equivalent to saying, because of adjointness, that J upper star composed with J upper star is isomorphic to the identity functor of E prime. So this is the definition of subtopos. So you see that in this um, definition, everything is categorical. Everything is phrased in the language of categories, which is very natural because uh, uh, toposes are just uh, particular categories. But we see that uh, uh, in the language of categories, we have expressed geometrical notions, especially the notion of point and the notion of subspace. Here, the notion of subtopos. And also the notion of uh, relative toposis, which means a topos considered over another topos through a morphism. And in fact, this uh, will be uh, studied uh, uh, much more uh, uh, in uh, uh, Olivia's uh, lectures. Okay, so uh, of course, this uh, definition uh, was given in order to have uh, the following examples. So first, uh, any topological map, map it, any continuous map between topological spaces induces a morphism of toposes. And in fact, uh, this is one to one is why is a sober is a sober topological space. So this means that uh, if y is sober, to consider a continuous map from some topological space X to Y is the same thing as to consider a topos morphism from the topos associated to X, so EX, to the topos associated to Y. So the so this, of course, applies in particular if X is a topological space with only one point. And so this means, in particular, that the points of Y identify with the points of the associated topos, EY, if Y is a sober topological space. Uh, another remark uh, is that uh, if we have a topology J on a small category C, uh, then uh, the topos defined by J is a subtopos of the topos of three sheaves on C. And uh, the last example is that uh, any uh, functor between two small categories uh, induces uh, a morphism of toposes from uh, uh, C hat to D hat, so in the same direction. Okay. okay, so by now I, I have uh, given a review of the theory of toposes. Uh, I hope I have uh, given to you an idea of uh, um, what uh, a topos can be. Uh, um, and I, in fact, I have given uh, full definitions uh, together with uh, the basic uh, most important examples. And by now, I want to uh, explain the other half of the ingredients uh, necessary uh, to uh, understand uh, the theorem of existence of classifying toposes, which is the linguistic presentation of mathematics. So here uh, we have to use some uh, language which is familiar to logicians. Uh, and uh, we, um, just as a warning, we should not be afraid by uh, this uh, language uh, because uh, it is just uh, a way to uh, make ourselves aware of uh, what we are doing all the time 
uh, when uh, we write mathematics. So, um, a first order uh, theory consists uh, uh, by definition in language, in a language plus grammar rules. So, so this, if you prefer, in a vocabulary, in a list in a, of names on the one hand, and on the other hand, grammar rules. And the grammar rules are, in mathematics are called axioms. So first we begin with the language. So the first order language uh, consists in uh, three types of names. First, there are names of objects, but uh, which uh, logicians uh, call sorts. So uh, for instance, uh, if we talk, uh, if we want to consider group theory, uh, here there is only uh, one name of object, uh, which is just uh, the name group, or if you prefer, uh, the letter G. Uh, if we consider the theory of rings, uh, there is uh, only uh, one name of object, uh, which is the name ring, or if you prefer, the letter R. Uh, if we consider the theory of fields, uh, there is uh, only one uh, name, K, okay, uh, or one letter, K, okay, uh, the name field, the letter K. Uh, if we consider the theory of vector fields over, uh, of vector spaces over uh, field, so then there are two names, the name vector space and the name field. And uh, we can choose letter for that. Uh, so for instance, V for vector space and K for field. Or we can consider the theory of modules over a ring. And here there are two names, modules and rings. Or uh, we can uh, write them as letters, uh, M and R. Okay, this is just uh, names of objects we are considering. Then uh, the second type of names are names of morphism or names of functions, or function symbols, as they are called. So a function symbol consists in a letter F uh, going from a collection of, from a finite family of names of objects to a name of object. Uh, so for instance, if we talk, want to talk about addition, so addition is, is certainly a name of morphism, and the addition is a binary operation. So this thing, it is a function symbol from, uh, so in, in the case, for instance, of a ring, from R, R, because uh, addition is on two variables, both in R, from R, R to R. If we want to consider outer multiplication in a module over a ring, so this is a function from Rm to M, because one variable has to be in R, one variable has to be in M, and the function goes to M. And lastly, uh, there are uh, families of, uh, there is a family of names of relations. So for instance, if we want to talk about uh, uh, the theory of equivalence relations. So what is an equivalence relation? It is a subobject in the product of some object. So here, uh, the equivalence relation is, will be some subobject R of, for instance, E, E, where E, uh, for, for instance, can be a set or it can be an object of a topos. So uh, it is, you see, you have a name of object E, on an equivalence relation R, which has to be a subobject of EE. -E. Um, here, uh, an important remark is that uh, uh, it is possible in this uh, definition to take n equals zero. So uh, a function symbol from uh, zero to B uh, is called a constant symbol. And a, pro, uh, a relation inside the empty family of names is called a proposition symbol. So uh, let's immediately uh, take uh, examples. Uh, so for instance, the language of the theory of groups. So in the theory of groups, you have uh, one 
uh, name of uh, object, which is G, and there are three function symbols. So, so first for multiplication from G, G to G, uh, then going to the inverse, this is to G from G to G. And lastly, uh, there is a constant one, which goes from the empty family of names to the name G. It corresponds to choosing one element of G, one constant in G. And in that case, there are no relation symbols. If we want to talk about the language of the theory of equivalence relations, we have to choose one sort E, which will be the underlying object, no function symbol, and the relation symbol are <coughs> inside EE, because we want to consider a sub-object of the product of an object with, with itself. Okay, so this is the language of a theory. And uh, by now, uh, I want to spell out uh, what it means to interpret such a language. Uh, so uh, logicians uh, don't use the name language, they use the, they use the name signature. Uh, so for such a signature, which means a first order language, and uh, for any uh, topos, or more generally for any category with finite products, including a terminal object, then we can, inter we can talk about interpretations of the language uh, sigma, of the signature sigma. So what is a sigma structure M in such a topos E? or in, a, in such a category E. It is a map, a map which was associates to any sort, which means to any name of object A, an object which is called MA. And it has to associate to any function symbol, F going to A1, AN to B, a morphism which goes from the product MA1 cross MAN to MB. The product here we are, uh, of course, when we, we write this MA1 cross MAN, this is a product of the objects MA1, MAN in the category E. And MB is also an object of E. So it has a meaning to talk about morphism from M1 cross 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 MN to MB. And in the case N equals zero, so we have a constant symbol. And then we, we um, um, structure, uh, sigma structure consists in associating to such a constant symbol, <coughs> a map going from the a morphism, going from the terminal object to the object of name B, which is MB. And to any relation symbol, uh, R inside A1, AN, uh, we have to associate a sub-object MR of MA1 cross MA. So a sigma structure is a way to associate to any name of object, an object of E, to any, to any name of morphism, a morphism in E between the corresponding objects, and for any relation symbol, a corresponding uh, sub-object of the product of objects associated to uh, the names of objects, uh, which are the context of the relation symbol. Okay. And uh, by now, it is also possible to talk about uh, morphism between two such sigma structures. So let's consider two uh, such uh, sigma structures, M and N which means two maps, uh, which associate, I repeat, to any name of object, an object, to any name of function, morphism, to any uh, name of relation, a sub-object. And so a morphism of sigma structure is a family, is a map, which associates to any name of object A, to any sort A, a morphism in the category E, from MA to NA. So a morphism between the corresponding objects with the name A associated to A through the two sigma structures M and N. 
and they have to verify two properties. So first, they have to, to be compatible with the function symbols. So this means that for any function symbol f of from a1, a n to b, the associated square, which is drawn on the edge, is commutative. And uh, for any relation symbol r uh, inside some a1, a n, uh, there is an associated commutative square as at the bottom of the page. OK. And so uh, this means by now that uh, given the signature, which means uh, given a first order language, we can associate to any topos, or more generally to any category with finite products, the category of the sigma structures in this category E. And not only that, but if we have a functor between two such categories which respect finite limits, or more generally, which respect finite products and monomorphism, there is an induced functor between the associated categories of sigma structure. So in particular, for any morphism of toposes consisting of a pair of adjoint functors, f lower star and f upper star, there are two induced functors, which in fact are adjoint, between the categories of sigma structures on E and E prime. So the pullback functor and the push forward functor. They are well defined because both F upper star and F lower star respect finite limits. So in particular, they respect finite products, they respect the terminal objects, and they respect subobjects. Okay, so I just uh, look. Uh, yeah, so uh, by now I'm uh, I am going to. Uh, Excuse me, Laura. Maybe this is a good time to stop. Yes, exactly. This is what I wanted to say. Uh, 